And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Great today to have on Ryan T. Anderson, President of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Uh, Ryan, how are you this morning? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And Ryan, so I've been looking forward to this uh, for some time. I certainly consider you a thought leader and in a sense, perhaps a, a happy warrior as well. And, and today we're going to try to solve literally all of the world's problems. <laughs> we're going to talk about the sanctity of life. Uh, as well as religious liberty, a little bit about the transgender movement. But I was, what I was hoping to do today was just to catch a little bit of your wisdom, what you're seeing, what you're thinking about in public life. Now, if you're not familiar with Ryan, again, the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, founding editor of Public Discourse, the co-author of five books, including Tearing Us Apart, How Abortion Harms Everything and Solves Nothing, Releasing Soon, When Harry Became Sally, many might be familiar with that, and then truth overruled the future of marriage and religious freedom. And I, I certainly found this interesting. Your research has been cited by uh, two U.S. Supreme Court justices in Supreme Court cases. So that's certainly a feather in the cap there. So Ryan, if yeah. you would jump in, maybe and just they were, go ahead. They were both dissents. So unfortunately, oh, okay. <laughs> we lost we lost both of the cases where, you know, where I was uh, cited. Uh, it was Alito and, and Thomas in the... Um, yeah. Windsor case and the Obergefell case. So the, wow. the federal definition of marriage act and then the, um, the state marriage laws. Um, so it's, yeah. <laughs> and that, that does bring up an interesting, it's, uh, I appreciate that context, certainly still important. And you, you were an early defender of, of marriage uh, as the finest between a man and a woman, uh, even back in, you know, 13, 14 into 15 at a, a very young age. And I, I was just interested what, and I'll ask you about your, your bio more generally, but what kind of gave you the confidence or led you into stepping into that very contested role? And, and, and you know, I think it was even, even earlier, I think the article, uh, um, so the short answer is I was an undergraduate at Princeton and um, during my undergraduate years, uh, the Goodridge decision came down. That was a 2003 decision in Massachusetts, redefining marriage in that state. And none of my friends um, could even understand why I believed what I believed about marriage. It wasn't that, you know, we disagreed. We couldn't even like arrive at disagreement because there, there wasn't even like mutual understanding. Um, and so just, you know, through a series of conversations um, with classmates, um, I eventually saw the need for something like this. I had a classmate a few years younger than me, Sharif Gerges, um, who's, you know, very good on these issues. He's now a law professor at Notre Dame, um, clerked on the Supreme Court, you know, all, all these great credentials. And then uh, there was a professor at uh, Princeton who was good on these issues, Robert George. And so the three of us, I think it was back in 2010, we published a law review article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy titled, What is Marriage? And then it was two years later, I think it was in 2012, mm. that the book came out, What is Marriage? Subtitled, Man and Woman, a Defense. And, and you know, our thought at that point, um, this was when the marriage movement was winning election after election. Every time marriage had been put to the ballot, you know, it had been democratically um, decided that it was the union of a man and a woman. I think up until that point, we hadn't lost a single democratic debate. Every time marriage had been redefined up until that point, it had been by the courts. Uh, and so we thought, you know, this is going to be in the court of public opinion. And the three of us as scholars are going to do our part of making the best argument we can that would be open and accessible to someone who didn't share any of our faith commitments, that didn't share any of our kind of presuppositions on other issues. Uh, and then the next year, um, I think, you know, it was it was later that year that Obama evolved. Um, that was it was okay. the 2012 campaign that Obama evolved on marriage. Remember, in, in 2008 no. when he ran, he said that he believed marriage was a sacred union between husband and wife. Right. By 2012, if I remember correctly, the timeline it was Biden had slipped up in an interview, maybe slipped up, maybe intentionally. So Biden came out in favor of gay marriage first, and then Obama, you know, announced he had evolved on the issue. And then a few months later, the Supreme Court granted cert on marriage. And that's how we then had the 2013 ruling and then the 2015 um, ruling. But that, I mean, that's really, you know, when you ask, like, you know, what was the genesis? It was very much of a, you know, being at a place like Princeton full of really, really smart, really, really secular, really, really liberal classmates. It was like, right, well, how do you explain, you know, a basic truth, a natural law truth, the truth written on the heart um, to people who aren't going to accept uh, an appeal to authority, an appeal to scripture, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I, I appreciate your courage in doing so. And I think that was a great example to 
other people of faith around the country when a lot of people were just kind of stepping back. Oh, can I even talk about this in, in public life? So I certainly appreciated that about your work. I'm um, just Thank maybe you. a quick, quick word about uh, your role at the EPPC and what that organization does. Sure. So um, uh, EPPC stands for the Ethics and Public Policy Center. I became president uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, February of 2021. Um, uh, it's now a 46 year old um, research institution, you know, think tank, public policy institution, right in the heart uh, of DC. Um, my office window looks right down on the dome of, 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 the, um, of the Catholic Cathedral, uh, St. Matthew's uh, right. in uh, downtown DC. And more of what we do is, I mean, the, the name is very descriptive. All of my books have very kind of like descriptive titles, truth and advertising. It's the same thing for EBPC. Uh, we think about public policy from an ethical perspective. Uh, we think about first, what are the ethical norms that should govern our public life? And then second, how do we apply those ethical norms uh, to important um, issues of the day? Uh, and so, you know, we do a lot of work on uh, life, um, the dignity of life at the beginning of life, at the end of life, a lot of work on the nature of marriage, uh, both defending the truth about what marriage is, but then also crafting public policy to promote marriage and to assist marriage. And, you know, we have a scholar, uh, Patrick Brown, who does a lot on that. We do a lot about our embodiment as male and female and some of the transgender issues, uh, a lot on religious liberty. Um, uh, we have a program on the courts. We have a program in Catholic studies led by George Weigel, a program um, evangelicals in public life, uh, an HHS project, a big tech project. I mean, so, you know, more or less a variety of, uh, um, of areas where we think, you know, serious moral reflection is necessary for a law. You know, in junior in the letter from the Birmingham jail teaches that, you know, a just law is a man-made law that squares with the natural law and the eternal law. Uh, and we think MLK got it right. He's quoting both Augustine and Aquinas in that letter. Uh, and, and we don't think that tradition is foreign to America. We don't think this is, you know, a violation of separation of church and state. We don't think this is imposing your morality or imposing your religion on others. Like this is the very bedrock foundation of what all of the founders thought they were doing when they spoke about the laws of nature and nature's God, right? Those are the things that need to inform um, uh, as a democratic matter how we think about what laws we should pass, which laws should be enacted, what public policy we should have. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Um, and, and it's a great privilege. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, um, but it's also a great privilege. And it's uh, the past year and a half has really been a great joy as well. You, you cover just a few uh, tough topics in that. <laughs> and listeners will, <laughs> will know we talk often about, we believe that our faith is both true and good. And I think mm. your, your work is the effort to to focus, focus on that, that second part to say that it's not just good for us, but good for all people. And, and that should work out in the public square in a way that leads to human flourishing. And so I, I certainly look to a, a lot of the work from EPPC to give us kind of breaking analysis, um, current analysis on these things. So appreciate your work there. Well, you have a, a new book coming out. Thank you. And it, Thank it is certainly a, an important time, a momentous uh, moment for the pro-life movement. The book's titled Tearing Us Apart. And in that, that book, you envision kind of post row America and the continuing abate, debate at the state level, if, if Dobbs goes the way that we hope it does, and this is sent back to the states. And it seems to me kind of the thesis of the book is that abortion has really kind of harmed everyone, even those that, that, that are proponents of it. Um, so would you dive into kind of what you're thinking with, with tearing us apart and, and kind of what the pro-life movement should do post Dobbs? Yeah, no, uh, great question. So actually, we, we just got the um, the hard copies in the mail. So All right. I take the dust jacket off just because when I flip through the book, the dust I find the dust jacket gets in the way. But this is this is the cover, and, and, and the, okay. your question points to the the, the subtitle, right? Um, the subtitle is how abortion harms everything and solves nothing, and that's really the thesis. Alexandra De Sanctis uh, is my co-author, and you know, and back in November, uh, we were saying December first is oral arguments in Dobbs we think we can count to five. There are going to be five votes to finally overturn uh, Roe v. Wade. And um, as a result, like we need a fresh presentation of the pro-life argument uh, because if Roe's overturned, what it, the court's most likely to do is to return abortion um, as a public policy matter to democratic branches of government, right? State legislatures, uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, also for that matter, I think the U.S. executive branch. I mean, What's going to happen here is that if we have a pro-life 
federal administration. There are a variety of executive orders and regulations that HHS, DOJ, others uh, could be putting forward to advance life. Congress can pass a federal heartbeat bill, a federal fetal pain bill, a federal federal, um, you know, fill in the blank, you know, you know, politics is the art of the possible. What can you, in this case, count to 64? And so that's going to be more difficult. And then all 50 states, the laboratories of democracy. And that means um, what we wanted to do was to equip our readers to be ready to have those conversations. Um, because when Roe is finally gone, we now need to do even more work to persuade our neighbors, to persuade people who don't already agree with us, about how abortion harms everything that it touches, how it solves nothing that it's been promised to solve, and how a just society uh, would love them both, um, both, uh, both the unborn baby and that mother and that larger family and that larger community. And you know, it's it's really a, um, to my mind, very humanistic vision uh, of what a healthy society should look like, being hospitable to both babies and mothers and fathers and marriages and families, you know, kind of concentric circles of solidarity uh, where, you know, we have duties to each other, responsibilities to each other. I, I think our culture speaks too much about rights without the corresponding duties, uh, without the, the thoughts about obligations that we owe to other because we belong to each other to quote, you know, Mother Teresa. Uh, and so the book, you know, it, you know, systematically chapter by chapter is meant to equip readers um, with rebutting the counter arguments. I mean, so first chapter is about how abortion harms an unborn baby. I mean, to a certain extent for a pro-lifer, that's obvious. Um, but we spend 30 pages explaining how it harms an unborn baby because there are various wow. pro-choice activists who say, well, it's not really a human being, it's a clump of cells. Or, okay, it's a human being, but it's not really a human person because personhood happens later. Or, okay, maybe it's a human person, but that's only because of your religious beliefs and you can't impose your religion on us or you can't impose your morality. on. And so there are a variety of... Um, arguments that we think pro-life advocates are going to need to be able to respond to. Uh, and we're giving uh, readers our best attempt at, you know, how we think those conversations should play out. And then, you know, second chapter is about how abortion harms women. Third chapter is uh, how it harms uh, people already on the periphery of life, um, racial minorities, uh, girls, elevated sex uh, discriminatory forms of abortion, um, people with disabilities, elevated rates of abortion. Mm. Uh, fourth chapter, how it corrupts medicine. Fifth chapter, how it's harmed our constitutional form of self-government. Sixth chapter, how it's harmed politics, the political parties, you know, democratic process. And then lastly, how it's harmed culture. Um, and it's really meant to be um, comprehensive in, in the sense of preparing a reader to engage, you know, at the little league game, at the water cooler at work, wherever someone might you know, bring up this topic, you know, you being ready um, to give a thoughtful, non-combative, non-bomb throwing uh, response. Something I, I definitely appreciate about your work, it, even though you, you know, graduated from Princeton, have all these degrees, and I, I'm actually feeling uh, a little self-conscious about the number of books I have behind me. I'm gonna have to kind of <laughs> bump that number up. They're sitting on that side. And so I'm gonna have to do something <laughs> about that. But that you, one, you're able to give individuals, like you said, the, the arguments that they need at the Little League game. Um, and so you, you can argue from the academic side of it, but also, and get cited in dissents at Supreme Court, but can also <laughs> give that, that single mom or single dad or somebody at church with those arguments. But the other thing that has struck me about your work is that many people of faith can bring a, a Bible uh, quotation to an argument. And that's good you know, to say, here's what God says. But for many individuals in our society, they're going to shut down right after that. And, and you're able to give these natural law arguments that can be obvious to individuals that even don't hold to a position of faith. And so I think your work's really important in helping uh, people of faith kind of translate what they believe in, in such a way that others in our society can grab a hold of it. And so I'm, I have the book pre-ordered. I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Thank you. And I mean, all I would say kind of um, to respond to that is, you know, from a theological perspective, we should expect there to be no contradiction, no tension, no conflict between faith and reason when both are done well, right? Good theology will never conflict with good science. Um, good hermeneutics will never conflict with good philosophy, right? I mean, the, because all truth has its ultimate source in God. All truth, truth has its ultimate source in God's creation, right? And so um, the natural law tradition of reasoning um, is just 
thinking through about the law written on the heart, right? And St. Paul testifies. And so um, if, if anything, I, I think, you know, Christians have, you know, the best um, reasons to take reason seriously. That's good. Because, you know, we know who the author of reason is. And, and, and so, I mean, this is something that's, you know, very interesting in a postmodern um, society. Um, you know, the Enlightenment thought that they were defending reason against um, uh, the, the, the backward Middle Ages, blah, blah, blah. And it seems today that it's Christians who are defending the dignity of reason um, from postmodernists, from deconstructivists who, who want to say that, you know, there's no such thing as reason. There's no such thing as truth. It's all just power uh, masquerading as reason. And so, so it's really um, fascinating to see, um, uh, you know, where, where we uh, have come down on this. But I think there's a certain intelligibility to that um, because we take the life of the mind serious. Um, God is logos. I mean, God is love. Yeah. God's also the word. And, and, mm. and the, the word meaning intelligibility, rationality. God isn't reasonable. He's reason itself, right? He's the embodiment. He is reason. Um, so anyway, um, this is why I think it's important that we have good theologians doing good theology. We also need good philosophers doing good philosophy, good scientists doing good, you know, biology, good social science, good psychology, psychiatry on, you know, some of the transgender issues. Um, there's a role for all of us, whatever our, you know, particular vocation and, and expertise, disciplinary um, to expertise is. And I appreciate, I appreciate that, in, that encouragement. And you've done this in the public square, you know, you, you've, you've had the articles written against you. You've even had a book canceled <laughs> in a sense. And that's why I appreciate you helping Christians see the importance of that natural law and to be confident that we do have uh, something good and something true to say to the world. Now, in, in the pro-life issue, the, the big question, of course, that we're getting these days is, well, all right, so the issue goes back to the states. You know, Rose Dunn, that's a, that's a big, big win. The work's just beginning on the persuasion front. But what's the next goal, in a sense? Where are we looking next? And, of course, the pro-choice movement is saying, well, next they're coming for abortion rights nationally. And is that something that those in the, the pro-life movement, maybe from a moral standpoint, but also just from strategy um, that we should push towards a, a court case or national legislation that says, well, not only do the states get to make this decision, but actually there should be a right to life, maybe sourced from the 14th Amendment, um, so that unborn babies are protected across the country. Yep. Um, all of the above. Um, and, and what I mean by that is um, immediately, um, you know, I, I can't count to five with the current members of the Supreme Court for them saying um, the word person um, entails an unborn um, human being and therefore states that don't protect unborn children are violating the constitution. I think I can at least count to 60 more readily um, with certain uh, protections for unborn human life. You know, not for a bill that would, you know, um, uh, entirely protect unborn human beings from the moment of conception, but maybe a 20 week bill, which, which is imp important here because if Roe is uh, finally overturned, as we all hope and pray, uh, um, you know, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama are going to pass, you know, very protective pro-life laws. Uh, Indiana, you know, you would know better than me what's what's possible there. Um, it's probably more protective than Illinois, right? your neighboring state, but probably not as protective as as Texas. But then Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, California, some of the deepest blue states, which are also some of the most populated states, are going to more or less have the Roe regime of abortion that just uh, decided by their state legislators, or you know, in the case of Kansas, having it imposed by their state uh, Supreme Court, um, if you think about the bad ruling from Kansas a couple of years ago. And so um, this is kind of, you know, um, a house divided cannot stand, right? I mean, some, some of Lincoln's insights about we can't be half slave, half free, mm -hmm. you know, having a country that's half pro-life, half pro-abortion, especially when you're going to be um, dealing with the questions of transporting people across state lines, mailing abortion pills across state lines. Um, federal legislation is entirely appropriate. Uh, the 14th Amendment says that no state can deny the equal to any person the equal protection of law and the due process of law. Uh, the word person, original public meaning of the word person was not 
you know, Peter Singer style ghost in the machine, you know, higher consciousness, you know, Lockean or Cartesian dualistic forms of person. The word person meant human being. No state shall deny any human being the equal protection of the law or the due process of law. Um, and so as a result, and then and so, so section five of the 14th Amendment says Congress shall enact legislation to protect the rights that the earlier sections of the 14th Amendment declare. So I think it's an entirely appropriate function of the federal government, the federal legislature in particular, um, to make legislation protecting unborn human beings. Um, you know, there, there, recently there's been some really good scholarship on this uh, from people like John Finnis at Oxford, Robert George uh, at Princeton, Josh Craddock from the James Wilson Institute. Um, and, and so I, I think that's another area that the pro-life movement's gonna need to um, uh, uh, develop. But again, I, I think more immediately, you could probably accomplish more in Indiana to protect unborn human beings within an immediate time frame than what we're gonna see you know, with the 14th Amendment arguments. But I think we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. I do think ultimately we need to have um, uh, legislation that protects unborn children um, in all 50 states. And that, that may very well require federal law uh, to accomplish. Because I mean, the ultimate goal here is every child has his or her life protected from the moment at which his or her life begins. Right? That's the ultimate, ultimate goal. And then that every woman uh, is provided with the assistance that she needs uh, to bring that baby into the world. Um, you know, some women aren't going to then be able to um, directly care for the child. And I think abortion is a very, or sorry, adoption is a very uh, pro-life choice in this situation. But we should also be thinking about pro-family policy. You know, what can we do mm. to make marriage more attainable, uh, to, to incentivize, to encourage marriage, to make marriage more affordable, um, and, you know, we have people at EPPC thinking about those questions and working on those policies. It's really helpful. And so short term, definitely hammering these things at the state level where we, where we can. And I'm um, certainly here in Indiana, we're, we're looking at that issue, <coughs> um, but then looking down the road as well. And that's exactly what I was hoping to, to capture. So in our, our kind of our time remaining, to kind of do a lightning round here. Okay. Uh, you wrote the, the book, um, Harry Became Sally. And so I wanted to capture kind of two two things real quickly. One being, I don't know if you could share just a little bit about the cancellation of the book from Amazon, but then also many Christians are kind of waking up to this transgender moment. And like a couple of years ago, who knew? And now it, the stats are just skyrocketing. Um, so maybe just some practical, uh, along the lines of what we've talked about, you're at a a baseball game and somebody is talking about this issue, what are some just good practical responses for people of faith? Yeah, um, excuse me, uh, great, great question, um, or both of them, great questions. Um, so with Amazon, I mean, it, it's interesting. The book came out um, February of 2018. And the reason why was that, you know, all throughout 2017, I'm researching and writing um, uh, the book. Actually, I guess it was the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, because then, you know, the publisher takes time to, you know, kill trees, print books, bind them. But um, what I I had noticed exactly what you were noticing, right? There, there, there's something that most Americans had never even heard of previously is now being declared a human right, right? Joe Biden regularly says that, you know, trans um, rights are the human rights issue of our generation. And in May of 2016, that was when the Obama administration redefined the word sex to be gender identity and then sent the Dear Colleague letter to all of our nations. Mm schools, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is when I realized um, I need to put my head um, uh, 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 kind of thinking through these questions. I did a bunch of reading, you know, get the book out. And Amazon sold it for the first three years. Uh, for the first three years, it comes out February of 2017. Um, it wasn't until February of 2021. And what had changed was that for those first three years, Donald Trump was president. Um, you know, Bill Barr was the attorney general. Uh, Josh Hawley was in the majority of the Senate. And I think Amazon rightly thought that if they canceled the book, there might be a DOJ in investigation. There might be a Senate hearing in which they're forced to answer uncomfortable questions. So what ends up happening in February of 2021, the weekend before the House of Representatives was scheduled to vote on the Equality Act. Equality Act, I imagine, you know, our listeners are familiar, you know, a radical transgender bill that would redefine the word sex to be gender identity, impose it all throughout the country. Um, that was when Amazon disappeared, disappeared the book, right? You couldn't get the Kindle, you couldn't get the hardback, the paperback, the Audible, 
even used books, right? Just gone from their website. Uh, and I think that was largely um, in an attempt to discredit me um, and to have a chilling effect so that other authors and more importantly, other publishers wouldn't publish books on this topic if they feared that, you know, we're not going to have access to the, to the world's largest retailer, right? Amazon is the, the globe's largest retailer and they claim to be the everything store, right? That they sell right. everything. So, so that, that's part one. Part two to your question is, I mean, I think that the, a very helpful way um, of, of, of thinking about this is what Paul, Paul McHugh suggests. Um, uh, Dr. McHugh was the former chair of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. He was a psychiatrist in chief at the hospital. And the analogy he draws to is anorexia. And he said, if you have a high school or college age uh, girl or woman suffering from anorexia, would you prescribe liposuction? And the answer is no. And everyone knows intuitively why the answer is no. There's nothing wrong with her body. Um, this is going to be um, a problem with thoughts, with feelings. Maybe it's a body image struggle, you know, as such. Maybe it's an eating disorder as such. I mean, those can actually have separate causes. And then what you try to do is figure out what's causing this particular individual to, you know, have struggles with food or have struggles with body image. Um, is it because of a bad family situation, a bad a romantic situation, a bad schooling situation, a bad you know exper experience that they um, suffered, you know abuse? Who, there are a variety of things. Uh, is it keeping up with other girls at the school? But what you would do is you would talk to the young lady, figure out what's causing this, and then direct any kind of interventions at those underlying causes. McHugh says do the same thing for gender dysphor dysphoria. If you have someone who doesn't feel comfortable in their own body, you want to talk with them about it, figure out, you know, is it something about the expectations that are being placed upon you? What you, what you think real boys or real girls are supposed to be like, and you don't fit those expectations. So that's why you don't feel comfortable in your body. You know, is it more, I think right now what we're seeing with rapid onset gender dysphoria, um, uh, it's a social contagion where it's, you know, not even a historic form of gender dysphoria where you feel a sense of alienation or, um, you know, a discomfort with your body, but it's more of an identity that you have um, uh, assu assumed as a way of kind of um, um, uh, being somewhat unique. Um, uh, we we've seen, it was just two weeks ago, the study showing the explosion with the generation after millennials with LGBT identification. Um, and this is not all like Lady Gaga style born that way or, you know, historic forms of gender dysphoria. It seems much more to be about an identity that you can latch onto to make you know, yourself unique, to make yourself um, stand out. While also then any struggles that you're having, and you know, the teenage years are difficult years for anyone, even in the best of circumstances, you can then you know, label the gender identity conflict as the cause of those struggles. So, um, I mean, th those are some of the ways to think about it. I mean, the, the book has, I don't know, 250 pages worth of, you know, it's very systematic of looking at the science, looking at the medicine, looking at the philosophy, looking at the law, looking at the culture um, on, you know, all the different transgender issues. Um, you can't get it at Amazon. To their credit, you can get it at Barnes and Nobles. Uh, and so, so that's where I direct people, um, you know, they're still selling it um, to their credit. And uh, again, that book is very thoughtful. It, it's not a polemic, you know, just throwing barbs at others. Um, very well written. And, and just, I think it's, a sign of, of where our culture is as far as the small L liberalism, the, the idea we can have these conversations about difficult topics. Um, so I'll, I'll ask my last two questions together and, and let you run with it. You presented um, at a, a conference last, uh, last winter, and the topic was why religious liberty isn't enough. I found it fascinating, and especially when I'm working with pastors something that I, I thought would be really helpful for them to hear. So would you explain just the, that basic thesis of why, you know, just having the right to defend ourselves isn't a full expression of neighbor love in our society. And then if you, you had a billboard on which to put a message to people of faith and, you know, quickly changing times, uh, what would you put on it? Okay. Um, great questions. So, um, and, and lightning routes, I'll be quick. Um, the, the argument, the argument of like the lecture that I gave, and, and I've written a couple papers um, uh, on this theme is, you know, religious liberty is important, but it's not enough. And here's why religious liberty is a real natural, natural right. It's a human right. It's a real authentic 
um, form of liberty that government you know, ought to protect, right? We should be free to live out um, what we believe to be true about what, what we owe God, right? Um, Madison says, you know, what's a right amongst people is a duty to the creator. And the reason that we have a political right to religious liberty is because we have du duties to the creator. Uh, and so religious liberty is important uh, because all of us need to have the space to fulfill those duties to the creator. Um, and you and I might disagree about those, what those duties are. And, and so, you know, we don't want the government telling us how to fulfill it, right? I mean, should you go to mass or should you go to praise and worship? Should you, um, you know, uh, uh, baptize babies as infants or should you have believers baptism as adults? Those are questions that we want to have space um, for us to decide on our own, on our own, right? And that's what religious liberty is all about. And, but then that extends to, should I bake a same-sex wedding cake? I don't think you should. And Jack Phillips didn't think he should, and he should have the freedom to run his business in accordance with his religious beliefs. But it's not enough. And here's why. We don't just want to be kind of like free in our private lives to live out the, the truth. Because remember, religious liberty is about duties to the creator. We want to enact good law in the first place. Uh, we don't just want exemptions from bad laws. Um, so the, the, take the Green family in Hobby Lobby. There was a federal, there still is, unfortunately, a federal mandate saying that all employers have to pay for um, the health care that includes coverage of four FDA labeled drugs and devices that could cause an early abortion. That's an unjust law, right? So it's not good enough. It's good that we are now exempting Hobby Lobby from that unjust law, but we should not have a law forcing anyone to pay for abortion causing drugs because we shouldn't have abortion causing drugs. I mean, like we shouldn't have um, uh, uh, abortion. And so it's not enough. And, and same thing is going to be true on the transgender issues. It's not enough to, to exempt um, Christian schools from bad transgender policy. Public schools shouldn't have bad transgender policy, right? I don't care if the female athlete is a believer or not. There shouldn't be boys competing against girls. Uh, I don't care if the prisoner is a believer or not. There shouldn't be men in women's prisons, right? These are violations of safety, violations of equality. Uh, and so our vocation as Christians in the public square is to enact good laws. And again, following from MLK, man-made codes that are in alignment with the natural law and the eternal law. I could, I could speak much longer, but you said a lightning round. So then your last question about the billboard. I think what I would put up um, uh, would just be uh, um, uh, two words, both and. I think so many things oh. um, uh, uh, are fa false dichotomies. So many things that trip up Christians in public life are false dichotomies. So, you know, should we work through the law or through the culture? And the response is both. We need to work both through the law and through the culture, right? Should we do state law or federal law? It's not an either or, both state and federal, you know, whether it's pro-life. Should we do religious liberty or should should we do... Um, you know, a sports bill or a privacy bill or, or you know, just outright banning um, uh, experimental um, transition uh, procedures for minors, right? Both and, right? We both need to be protecting religious liberty and we need to be enacting good laws. Should we focus on the unborn baby or on the mother? Both and, right? Focus both on the baby and on the mother. I could give you, you know, a litany of both ands where, where I think, um, Various forces want to try to make us pick one or the other. Uh, and I think we as, um, as kind of like Christians in the public sphere need to resist that temptation. Uh, um, and it's okay to specialize in one or the other to say, look, my, my, my role is more on the state or, you know, your role is more in the state. My role is more in the federal, you know, someone's role is more in the law. Someone's role is more in the culture. I mean, that's fine. Cause you know, we can't all be experts everywhere. And so specialization is appropriate. But I think it's a mistake to say everyone should be, you know, specializing the way that I specialize. Right? We need both um, uh, philosophers and theologians, right? I, I specialize in the philosophy, but I want other people to specialize in the theology. It's not an either or; it's a both there, a both and there as well. I so appreciate that, and I certainly appreciate your example as a, a faithful and, and reasonable presence doing the the both and uh, work in public life, and we'll. I'll share in the show notes the links to EPPC as well as the new book. Certainly encourage listeners to go pick that up. So thanks for taking the time with us today. Yeah, thank you.